This video was going to be about these waterproof lights that are either designed for dropping into vases, for table displays, or into pools or use outdoors. They truly are waterproof. And they've got a nice switching mechanism that when you turn it, the, uh, to close it, it not only seals it, but it lights up. It's a very decisive switching mechanism. I'll show you that, in fact. But the real point of this video is this charger. It's a plug-in mains charger with the pins that flip out the back. And when it's normally mounted together, you can put a rechargeable lithium cell in and uh, you can just uh, plug, plug a couple of the cells in, plug it into the wall and it charges them and then theoretically stops charging. There's the problem. It doesn't really stop charging that well. But these uh, this old lights are designed to take two 2032s. And the 2032, incidentally, relates to 20 is the diameter in 20 millimetres and 32 is the thickness in 3.2 millimetres. So that's 20 millimetres diameter, 3.2 millimetres thick. It's a very sort of easy way of uh, determining battery size. So the holder here can actually take two of these and to avoid shorting out against the edges of the cells, it's got a plastic channel with contacts coming up the side. So you sit either one or two cells in. It's quite good it can take one. It's got a nice big spring here that allows that. Because if you tried the rechargeable cells in it, they have a higher voltage. Whereas a standard CR2032 non-rechargeable has a new voltage of rough, roughly about 3 volts. These ones fully charged will be 4.2 volts. Also, if you put two in series like that, uh, there is a risk of damaging the cells through over-discharging if you just left it running all the time. So it's quite nice it can take a single cell. It makes it suitable for these rechargeable ones. So this uh, circuit board has a conductive ring around the outside and the spring in the middle. On the top it's got three LEDs in parallel and a resistor and when you screw the lid down the middle spring holds the battery in place and as you tighten it up it, the spring keeps it square against the front but when it hits the uh, rim it touches those contacts and lights up. It's very decisive. And also the fact it's got a silicon seal around the outside here means that it makes a very good seal. They're very good. The other one I was looking at was a, a car, a car, a dog a bit of a difference there, uh, a dog collar light, which has got a carabiner. It comes in uh, two parts. It comes in the sort of the front and the back bit, and they snap on over this sort of carabiner bit, and it takes a single 2032 cell on a circuit board that is quite clever again because the it's a standard cell holder, but the back contact for the negative connection is actually a tactile switch, which doubles up as not just the switch, but also the... Uh, button. So you actually you're pressing the cell to actually activate that. It's quite a nice uh, way of doing it. However, as I say, this video is not about these. It's about the batteries and the charger. So let's uh, power this up and do some tests. So the, I've got my wee cheapo meter here just because it's the one that's got the crock clips on it and it's perfect for things like this. And I shall clip it in series to measure the current. So this uh, thing has two LEDs in it. It's got a red LED to show that flashes to show it's charging, and it's got a green LED to show it's charged. They're not overly decisive, but uh, it, it's good enough. It does the job. Kind of gives you an indication. And I really like this charger in the sense that it's like uh, it's got this sort of uh, it's got this terrible flaw, and it's got some really interesting design. It's super cost optimized. The circuitry is just amazing. It's been fun reverse engineering. So let's put it into the Cliff Quick Test and power it up. This is where I'm going to make sure there's nothing metal underneath in the bench before I power it up, otherwise it may go bang. And while that's amusing, it's not terribly productive for the video. So the green LED has come on. If I take a cell, uh, not sure which one this is, let's plug it in anyway. It's uh, almost fully charged, so the current has gone down to about 2.9 volts, uh, amp, milliamps here. And the green LED is lit. If I plug in a, one that's not quite fully charged, I'm not sure what state this one, the current's gone up to the full charge current of about 24 milliamps. The red LED, you might not see it. Let's uh, put my hand around there without touching anything. The red LED is flash on and off. And initially I thought that's just a flashing red LED. It's quite a simple way of making it look sophisticated. It's not a flashing LED. Uh, so that's how it works. You can also stick in a non-rechargeable cell. I wouldn't really recommend that. And it will try to pump current through it. I'm not sure that's a good idea at all. That could cause that to explode. 
These things are so well sealed that uh, if pressure builds up on them, they really do go off the bang. They're quite surprising. So let's unplug that before I stick my fingers in it. I, I pad this meter to measure the voltages, it doesn't really matter. Suffice to say, I have measured voltages, and the red LED stays on till the cells are around about 4.13 volts, which is approaching the 4.2 volts that is desired. The green LED starts lighting around about 3.96 volts. So there is a point both the LEDs that, you know, the red one's flashing and the green one is lit to show it's kind of fully charged. So there's a bit of overlap, it's just the way the circuitry works. But the major flaw here is that once it reaches about 4.2 volts, the main charging current stops, but it still trickles one or two milliamps through and will just keep doing that. And you think, well, that's surely not that important. You know, it's just one or two milliamps. Except that these cells, the rechargeable cells, only have a capacity of about 40 milliamp power. And that means that if you go to bed and leave this charging, in a couple of hours it'll have charged it, and then it'll keep charging it, and the voltage will rise, and it will rise, and it could theoretically go up to about 5 volts, which is not very good for a lithium cell. It could actually cause it to fail. I'm not sure. I've never tried that. And uh, the circuitry is spectacularly optimised. So here's the circuit board. It's only got the transformer on this side, uh, an electrolytic capacitor for the low voltage side and the two LEDs on spacers. On this side, it's got uh, the switchboard power supply, which is based on a single transistor here. Oh, hold on, you know, I don't, I can show you much better than this. I took a picture for the reverse engineering. That's why it's all scribbled on. So let's uh, zoom up a bit. So here's a switchboard uh, power supply. In fact, let's just zoom in the switchboard power supply of it. And it's interesting to note that the rectifier is just a single diode and there's no smoothing capacitor. So literally, this switch mode supply only rides one half of the sine wave and switches during that time uh, along that portion of the sine wave. And it's got feedback. Um, I've drawn the schematic out. And in fact, you know what? Let's. Uh, I'll show you the schematic first um, after I've shown you what else is in here. But suffice to say that that's the mains power supply comes in, there's a single rectification diode at this side and the electrolytic capacitor down here. Then there's a transistor to switch the charging current and then this chip here, which I thought, oh, that's going to be something like a TP4056 or something like that, you know, a standard lithium charge controller set for low current. It's not. It's a dual op amp. It's an LM358. And it's also got one other IC here, uh, which I've... Uh, TP431, is it? I think it's TP... No, it's not TP431. Um, I'll just call it 431. There, that's good enough. But it's the programmable shunt regulator. In this case, they've common to the pins together, so it programs it at its default shunt uh, voltage, which is 2.5 volts, and that's being used as a reference for this chip. So let's uh, take a look at the schematic. And I've drawn it as three sections, because it technically is in three sections. So the first bit to look at here is the power supply. The main supply comes in here. The live goes through this 10 ohm resistor, well, live or neutral, because it's not polarized. Goes through a 10 ohm resistor, which acts as an inrush current limiter and a fuse. It goes through that big diode. Uh, let's uh, bring the picture in. I can show you the components here. So it goes through this 10 ohm resistor, this diode, uh, and it goes to the uh, one end of the primary winding. The primary winding is switched by this transistor, and it's a very ordinary transistor. And at the, on the emitter of the transistor, it has a 30 ohm resistor. And that made me think, this must be used for some sort of current regulating thing, you know, to stop the current going too high. Because if you're putting, say, 0 0.6 volts into this, or whatever volts this thing's putting out, the feedback winding, then as soon as the current reaches a level that the voltage across this capac this resistor rises up to about uh, 0.6 volts or whatever it is, then the transistor will start turning off. And it made me wonder, does this operate much in its linear region? So I got the thermal imaging camera, and yes, it does operate in its linear region quite a bit because it is very, very hot compared to the rest of that. But in fact, it's the hottest component of the circuit board. Not sure, I used a magnifying lens in this, so uh, the 101 might be an exaggeration, not sure. I think the 84 might be closer. I'm not sure that goes. I've not, I've not compared heat points uh, with the magnifying lens versus uh, just the standard lens. 
The feedback system is very, very neat. When the circuit's first powered up, there's a the transistor has a pull-down resistor to keep it turned off. But current starts flowing through this 330k resistor and it starts turning that transistor on. When it does, the this winding starts inducing current in this winding, which then goes through the 68 ohm resistor and this capacitor, blocking capacitor, and feeds the base. And that effectively has an amplifying effect that the more current flows, the more this uh, uh, more the higher the voltage in this, and it creates a sort of feedback loop up to the point that uh, the higher the core is saturated or this capacitor is fully uh, charged and then no current will flow and then it will collapse. And when it collapses, the magnetic field it's put into the coil does two things. In this, the secondary winding, it charges this capacitor via a diode. Note that the diode is in the negative rail instead of the positive rail. That's just one of It doesn't really matter. And it puts out roughly 8 volts. This is not an accurate power supply. Um, floating, the voltage floats up to about 9.23 volts. Uh, when it's loaded down with the charge current, it's 7.28 volts. So it's not that, that sort of uh, accurate. <clears throat> However, there's feedback in the form of this winding. This winding does double duty. It's not just the uh, feedback to the uh, turn the transistor on. But when the opposite polarity, when the field collapses, Depending on how much this side loads it down, a voltage will be induced across the uh, feedback winding and will, via this diode, it will reverse charge this capacitor here. And that capacitor, uh, that, uh, this capacitor here, and it effectively goes negative with respect to the zero volt rail of this circuit. And that means that in order for this transistor to turn on, you've not just got the... Uh, just a zero volt to actually exceed with your feedback signal. But you've got the Zener diode here uh, that you have to exceed the voltage of that Zener deducted from the capacitor, so to speak, before that will turn on. It means that if this side is lightly loaded and the voltage floats up high, what that does is it basically turns this uh, switching circuit off or, or reduces its output to match. So um, it's quite... It's really well engineered in the sense that it's just optimised to use a single standard high voltage tr transistor. And this transistor is rated 400 volts and they're using it on rectified 240 volts AC, which is going to peak about 350-ish volts, so it's pretty close to its uh, rating. But it's a very simple circuit. Every component counts. It's, it's kind of interesting in its own right. But let's uh, now we've got our 9 volts or so or 8 volts. Let's take a look at the first section of the circuitry, and that's the charging section. So here's our 8 volt rail, here's our 0 volt rail. I'm not sure what the isolation is like. Uh, I may do a high voltage test on it later, but it's a tiny transformer. They've got a massive, um, by Chinese standards, they've got a massive uh, gap on the circuit board between the main side and the low voltage side, which is impressive. It all depends on how well separated the windings are in this transformer. It certainly doesn't meet what you'd call UK standards in terms of uh, the... Uh, well, I don't think it's using the double insulated or triple insulated output. I think it's just using standard copper wire. Yes, it is. And there's a very good chance that it's wound in fairly close intimacy to the higher voltage windings. So I'm not sure what the separation will be. Oh, one other thing that I didn't mention about the uh, switching circuit... It has a 68K resistor across the primary. I think that's just a very simple way of just shunting uh, the speak, speaks, spikes. Pe I was going to say peaks. I was going to say spikes. I said speaks. That's what happens. Uh, so when that transistor turns on, you can often get a quite, a, quite a spike across that. And normally, the circuit that's used to suppress that is a capacitor and diode and resistor arrangement. But in this case, I wonder if by putting a resistor across that to damp it, it just provides an alternative path for that current and just limits the, the level of that peak, which could be modestly high, given how close it is rated to the transistor's rating at the mains, peak mains voltage. <coughs> the charge circuitry consists of this. There is a voltage reference over here, and, uh, well, what's the best way to start here? Yeah, okay, here's the op-amp and a voltage reference. The voltage reference is the, um, 
What is the number actually printed in that? Am I going to be able to read this? It just says 431, which is reasonable enough. It's, it's a mass cloned component. But the idea of the 431 is that uh, you've got, uh, it acts as a programmable shunt. These are really commonly used in a lot of switch mode power supplies for feedback. And you can set the voltage at which that starts conducting. And it means that if you put the LED in the feedback, the opto isolator, then as soon as you reach the pre-programmed voltage, current will start flowing through that LED and it will give the feedback. That's in other supplies. It's not doing that in this one. In this one, it's got a, from the positive rail, it's got the transistor or a 2K resistor. And this is this 2K resistor here is like the naughty one. It's like, what on earth are they doing? But uh, the 2K resistor lets some current through. Then there's a 2.2K resistor. And then this caps it at 2.5 volts. 2.5 volts is its reference voltage. When you're dividing it down, you have to use a resistive divider if you're going to use that for a different voltage. But in this case, if you just short the, the connections together, it is 2.5. So the input to this op amp is 2.5. The voltage across the cells is measured by a potential divider and compared to that. Here they've got uh, two resistors in parallel, 3.9K and 10K, and they're forming one par one resistor. And the reason they've got two is so they can fine-tune the value. The other part of the divider is just a standard 5.6K. And ideally, you choose those values so that you reach, when this is reaching about 4.2-ish volts, then this will go up to about 2.5 and it'll match the 2.5 reference and that's what an op amp does. It looks for, a, it compares the input voltages and when one is, when they match or one goes hi higher or lower than the other, the output will change state depending on where you've got them connected to the negative or the positive uh, input. The output then drives the transistor. So normally if the voltage is low, the output will be high. And it will, or should I say it will be low, because that's a PNP transistor. There's the resistor to keep the transistor off. Here's the resistor that turns it on by pulling it low. And there is the main current limiting resistor to the cells, the 150 ohm resistor. The cells are just in parallel. I'm not sure I'm keen on that, because it means if you've got a really flat cell and you've got a fully charged cell, one could be a voltage of 3 volts or less, the other could be a voltage of 4.2, and you basically just connect them in parallel, and these things are not designed to take a high uh, charge current, so I'm not sure that goes there. I think some a modest amount of current could flow between them. It would have been nicer if they just used a separate resistor for each of these, but they didn't. Um, other things, the... Output from this op amp also goes to the LED circuit, but fundamentally what you see here is the charge circuit. And the problem here is that resistor is just, you know, even when this transistor turns off and it should stop the charge current, then that resistor is going to leak current. And that's where that current is coming from. It's, uh, it's forming a sort of potential divider with this and the voltage reference here, but there's still enough to push a bit of current through this 150 ohm resistor. I don't know why they've got this resistor. I really don't know why that's there. Why didn't they just take the 2.2k straight up to the positive rail to provide that current uh, for the voltage reference? I'm very tempted to try that and see if it fixes a problem. It's very strange. But anyway, the output of the op amp goes to the LEDs. And this is where I thought one of the LEDs was a flashing LED, but it's not. Only one half of the op amp has been used, and the other half is used to flash the LED. So here's that signal, and when it's high, when it's finished charging and it goes high to turn that transistor off, then the green LED here lights. But when it's charging and it goes low, this LED can light, but only when it's enabled from the op amp here. So what they're doing here is they've formed an oscillator with uh, feedback and uh, also a hysteresis point. It's all very clever. It's quite an educational circuit. So initially, say for instance that the output uh, of this is high and the LED is lit. If the output's high, then this potential divider is kind of, it's a moot point, it's not really in circuit, so the positive connection, the positive input, should I say, to the op-amp is floating near the sort of rail. And this capacitor charges up until the voltage across it reaches um, the 
rail the same level. And as soon as it does and the output starts changing state, it will start going negative. But when it does so, that because it's then pulling this potential divider down to the zero volt rail, suddenly the voltage le level on this suddenly drops to the sort of close to the zero volt rail. And then the capacitor then starts getting discharged via this resistor again. And it forms, basically, it goes in a loop until it reaches each of those thresholds. It's almost like a Schmidt trigger. It's very interesting way they've done it. It's a fairly standard op-amp circuit. This is how a lot of circuitry used to be designed before I started using microcontrollers. Um, and that's it. The output, as well as doing the, the charging and the, the changing the uh, voltage threshold, also goes through this 1.5k resistor street, which seems quite ungenerous. It's quite a high volume. Uh, and it makes the red LED light dimly and flash on and off. And the point at which uh, the green's lit and the red are lit is the point that the the charge detection circuit is in a sort of midpoint between the two power rails. It doesn't just suddenly snap between the power rails. It gradually makes a transition. And that's uh, why, that, uh, why the, both of them light together. But now I'm very intrigued. I want to make a modification to this and see if it helps. So what I'm going to do I'm going to remove this 2K resistor completely and I'm going to um, take this connection here and take it direct up to the uh, positive rail. So that means this will get its uh, current for its voltage reference, the 25 volt reference, and there will be no current leaking through here. I'm not sure why they didn't do that before, but uh, on goes the soldering iron. I'm about to do that. So this may take a bit of footering about. Should I do it while the camera is running. The soldier iron is going to have to heat up. I shall pause momentarily. The soldier iron is hot. Let us attempt this surgery. Um, I'm really crap at surface mount, so I want rid of this resistor here. So I'm going to try and heat the soldier on both sides of that and just basically ping it off the circuit board. That went better than expected. The resistor appears to have a uh, either bridge something else to the circuit board or it's come off completely. I think it's come off completely. That's good. The other resistor I want off is this one here, which is the uh, current reference resistor. So let's uh, heat that one up by just using brute force and ignorance and wipe the resistor off. Likely the resistor's just sticking the solder iron. Okay, this is good. This is good. It's all going to plan so far. Plenty of time for it to go horribly wrong, though. Let's crop this lead of this ordinary resistor down to a suitable length and tin it. So let's uh, tin the end of this lead, flow some fresh, juicy lead-based solder onto the shunt regulator here. Try not to uh, reflect the... Oh, let's get some solder onto the regulator, not, not just... Try and ram the resistor straight on. Let's uh, get some fresh solder onto that. Oh, that's that's quite good. It's very juicy. Always use lead-based solder for home stuff. It's just so much better. Leave the lead-free stuff for the fish stuff. So that is one end of the resistor soldered onto there. Now I need to find a place to put the other end of the resistor, which is a positive rail. And that just happens, the closest one happens to be the transformer pin, actually which is the positive rail. That's fine. The transformer pin it is then. So I shall flow some fresh solder onto that. Put the uh, resistor down a wee bit onto that. And then flow some fresh solder on again. To make a connection, just leave that resistor floating precariously above the circuit board. So let's see my inner shot here. Yes, I am. Let's uh, flood that on. That looks pretty good. And just crop that lead so it doesn't go anywhere it shouldn't do. Using different snips. Cheap eBay snips, but uh, different ones because the other ones I tried to cut something that was way too hard with them. And ruined them, as you do. So let's uh, shape that up a little bit. Let's bring the meters back in and see if that's fixed it. It may have. Uh, it may be the circuit has been so optimised that it's got other that doing that might not fix it. I don't. I think that'll fix it, unless there's some other current route through that uh, that 
leakage current can still find its way, but I don't think there is. So let's uh, connect this meter to here. Connect that to here. It's worth mentioning when I got this that the contacts, one side worked fine. I kind of expected these to be on the circuit board, um, but they're separate. They're actually pressed into the plastic housing. One of them was fine, but the negative connection on one side was not making a connection. When they'd uh, pressed it in, it had just bowed slightly in the wrong way. <coughs> so uh, let's get the quick test. Oh. <coughs> one cliff quick test. Plug it in and see if it disappears in a puff of copper with an ear-shattering explosion. Okay, let's turn that on. Good start, the green LED is lit. Let's uh, find a cell and plug it in. It's still showing 2.5, but... That source of leakage current should be gone now, so if I let that charge fully, it should theoretically turn, it should go below that, it should reach the point that uh, there is no residual um, charging. What voltage is across that at the moment? I may have to pause while it charges up to the full thing and then tell you what the result was afterwards. Let's measure across this, keep my fingers away from that circuit board there. The voltage is currently at 4.15, so it's not quite reached the end of charge yet. Okay, I shall uh, give that some time, uh, and then I'll have to come back after that, so uh, there will be a slight pause. Now, while I was uh, making this video, this lamp rolled onto the uh, table just as I was preparing, and I was hearing the rattling about, and I opened it up, and it's because I'd uh, taken the circuit board out and put the contacts the press-in contacts in the back had put them inside it. And uh, I was just thinking, when I shook this, it was like a wee miraculous. So and it made me think, see when I was at primary school, and primary school in the UK is, you go there from about the age of five until about the age of 11 before you go to secondary school. And uh, the teacher told us one day to bring in a glass light bulb and a, the core out of a toilet roll, the little cardboard tube. And we brought these in. <laughs> And she had newspaper, and <laughs> we taped the light bulb into the uh, toilet toilet roll tube, and then put paper mache all around it and covered the end up. And we were like, "What's this about?" And after we'd done it, and like after several days, and the paper mache had set completely, the teacher came round and told us to smash the thing on a uh, on the windowsill. And you heard all the glass break inside. Keep in mind, this is primary school. <laughs> What we just made was a maraca full of broken glass. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. It's so funny when you think about it, that you think of all these sort of PC things these days, that here we are with these little, we're all running around shaking our glass-filled paper mache maracas. I thought that was great. Well, at the time I thought it, I really thought it was great. I didn't kind of think about things. But, uh, right, I'm going to leave this uh, charging for a while and I'll be back shortly. So a short time later, the current is now gradually reducing. It's down at about uh, 50 microamps now. So that has solved that residual leakage problem. And the voltage it's stabling out at, stabilising out at is um, 4.16 is where it's more or less ending the charge. So that's kind of fixed that. It's not ideal that you'd have to do that. Uh, the final test I want to do with this then is electrical separation using a high voltage test on it. So let's uh, bring the gear up for that. And I'll probably, I should get the soldering on for that so I can tack some leads onto this. So uh, let's, uh, this uh, incidentally hasn't fixed the reverse discharge thing. Uh, that's a bit trickier. You could theoretically put a diode in, but then you'd have to allow for the diode drop. And then with the uh, charge voltage uh, variation, you'd have to allow that on it to typically end about, instead of 4.2, it'd have to be 4.2 plus the diode drop. It all gets a wee bit tricky. This is where dedicated chips really sort of win the TP4056 that basically just disconnect the battery completely when it's fully charged. Right, so let's get this out the way. These meters, uh, the wee cheapy meters, are ideal for applications like this. It's just a wee extra bench meter that you can just stick in and leave in at one setting. I like the fact, it's a weakness as well, I like the fact it's got the current range on the same connectors here, but that's also a weakness since it means that if you're 
uh, mess around the meter and you turn it up to the, if you turn it round uh, in the direction of the current range when it's connected to a voltage supply, it will just blow the fuse in the meter if there is one. It's one of the little weaknesses of that. So let's, uh, the solder iron is just about up to temperature, I think. Let's bridge these two connections together. Because one of them is connected to the... Do I want to do that? Uh, one of them is connected to... One of them is connected to the uh, coil. One of them is connected via the diode. Or do I actually want to bridge wires right across? The What I really want to test here is between the transformer and this side. I'll just solder a couple of leads on. That's the best bet. I shall grab yellow wire. Yellow for hazards. And strip it. I'm wanting to test the electrical isolation of the transformer, so what I'm doing here is I'm commoning the two primary coils, the primary and feedback, and I'm also going to connect onto the output with the other winding, uh, other wire, and that will give an indication of the uh, resilience of the insulation. Where's the solder? What have I done with the solder? I've put the solder over here. So let's tin this wire. Let's uh, find my transformer connections that I want to go onto. I won't be using this to charge lithium cells because it's just not ideal for it. It may not be suitable for charging lithium cells by the time I finish this test. If it does that. Uh, ah, the camera has just started again, I think. It's got that file size limitation and it will start recording. Yeah, it has. I just heard it go ping and stop momentarily. And then it starts recording the next section of the video. That means the video has gone on for quite some time. Sorry about that, but it's quite a complex video. More complex than it was originally supposed to be. It was like, hey, can you use the batteries in these? No. It turned into something much more complex, but much more interesting. And the length of the video doesn't actually take into account the amount of time it took to actually reverse engineer this. It was, it was fun. It's like an electronic puzzle. So I'm only going to connect to one end of the windings here because it, the impedance of the or resistance of the uh, coils is so low that, that it doesn't really matter. You don't need to connect to both ends. Righty ho. Let's get the. I'll leave the solder iron on. In fact, let's bring the electrical tester up and brutally assault this with electricity. So I need to strip these, strip that, make sure all the other wires are kind of out the way, and bring the tester up. Here's the tester. Uh, getting the lead for the tester would have been quite handy. Let's sort these leads out. Oops. So I'm going to connect the ground lead to one of them. Let's uh, zoom down onto this uh, unit here. Let's zoom down onto this. This is the bit we're interested in. And I'm going to trap the other lead by twisting it together and then stuffing it up the end of this probe in a non-compliant manner. Is this going to jam properly? Yes, it has jammed properly. That may kind of release, but then we'll see how it goes. So here's the little circuit we're going to be testing. I'm just going to get a lead for this tester. Yeah, I knew that was going to ping out. It's not how you're supposed to use that. So let's uh, get this in here. I may have to uh, get scientific about this. Or maybe not. Maybe I'll just get more brute force. I can always hold the trigger in with my hand. Right, let's test this. Let's make sure all the leads are nowhere where they can actually do some damage because everything will be at very high voltage in the vicinity of this for a while. Yeah, that looks pretty good. That's uh, everything out the way. Let's turn this on and crank it up to 2000 volts and see if that flashes over. This time there's no class Y suppression capacitor to worry about. Let's take the uh, exposure off to brightness up. There we go. 600 volts, 800 volts, 900 volts, 
1,000 volts, 1,300, 400. Very little leakage at this point in time. 8,000, 1.9 thousand, 2,000. Getting a very slight leakage, but that's capacitance between the windings, probably. Um, there's no class Y capacitor in this because there's no lead in it. I guess they reckon it's not really needed for that. Uh, let's, shall we go up to, I can't go up higher, I can go, uh, I could put it to the 4,000 volt range. Will we go up to 3,000 volts AC? Yes, we shall. Let's uh, rock it right up to... Someone's saying 3,000 volts AC is a good test for this. I reckon 2,000 volts AC will be peaking at sort of 3,000 volts region. I can hear Corona. I can hear it buzzing. I can hear Corona discharge. But it's made it to 3,000 volts. It's making fuzzing, buzzing noises, but that is probably Corona discharge. It's holding up. That's quite impressive. That is very impressive. Should we just destroy it? Should we go up to 4,000 volts? Yes, we shall. So I'm the, setting the leakage to uh, just one milliamp. Oh. Now, did it arc across? Hold on, let's uh, not set to one milliamp then. Let's uh, see what actually happened there. Can you hear it fuzzing and buzzing? The current's quite low, it's only about 50 microamps leakage. I'm guessing that if it tripped, that is arcing across, but it's doing so at 3450 volts, which is reasonable enough. And just out of interest, what happens if I bump it straight back up to 2000 again and just leave it sitting there for a while? Oh, I set it way up too high. Still getting used to this thing. Oh, I've, I've been over greedy again. Uh, as soon, if you set it to 2000 volts, as soon as you uh, exceed the 2000 volt test, it won't let you go any higher and it cuts it off to zero. So it's still holding up. So it was kind of arcing over somewhere. I wonder if that was arcing be between windings, but 4,000 volts is quite a bit uh, to hold up to. Well, that was 3,500 volts. So um, I suppose that technically speaking, it's kind of passed, hasn't it? Hmm. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing, but to be honest, I wouldn't really recommend them uh, because it has that built-in weakness. It seems like it'd be quite a useful little thing to just uh, have that uh, facility to just ram a couple of button cells into it and charge them. But as I say, if you leave it uh, overnight, it could potentially charge these up to quite high voltage in its original circuit format. So possibly really just a fail then, I'm afraid. Well, since this video has already turned into an absolutely massive bloated apocalypse of video, it really wasn't supposed to last this long. Let's just do the final slap and open the transformer up and see what it's like inside if its separation is. Well, we kind of know its separation is kind of probably not going to be up to European, American, British type standards. Um, I'm guessing that the windings will be wound over the top of each other, as they often are in these things. Let's uh, grab the core with, let's just crush it. Crush it, give it a wee wiggle. Yeah, there it goes, there it goes. It's Well, something's moved. No, it's not. It's not coming out right. Uh, no, you should squeeze this. It isn't going to... Oh, there we go. There we go. That sounds quite promising. Okay. Right, let's uh, get in close to this and start picking off the insulation. So uh, let's uh, zoom right in. And I'll try and stay in focus. It's rare, but sometimes it does happen. So let's uh, peel off this outer layer of tape here. Actually, it's not so much staying in focus, it's actually staying in the shot. That's the secret here. Especially when I get distracted. Okay, I can see a feedback winding. Oh, and a layer of black tape. It's not the usual yellow tape. It's black. So... That is a feedback winding going to... Is that feedback winding or is that a primary? 
Hold on, I'm just going to have to get the circuit board and take a look at that. Where is the circuit board? It was in like that. It's the feedback winding. Yes, it is. It's a feedback. Okay. So that's a feedback winding wound over the top. Let's cut that off. It's well clear of the um, secondary. Well, it's got that layer of, well, it's got a layer of tape. That is well clear by Chinese standards. I can say Chinese standards in general because, uh, of course, all the best stuff's also made in China. Which makes the current trade embargo against China kind of a bit weird. Don't you want products? Uh, the downside of this black tape is I can't actually see the end. This is where I'm going to destroy something, isn't it? I'd like to carefully pick the end of that tape to unroll it properly, but it is jet black and that's not helpful. I wonder why they've used black tape. And also, as they wind this on quite tight, and then they put the windings over the top of it, so that doesn't really help much. This could get messy. It's just got messy. I've just damaged the winding underneath, not to worry. What do we have here? It's a heavyish winding. I'm guessing that winding. Uh, is probably the secondary. Yep, yeah, the secondary. Now, here's something interesting to note. The secondary windings here. Uh, is going to its pins at the complete opposite side from the other, so it isn't actually going too close to... Uh, well, I'm going to have to review that now. Where was that? Uh, if you skip back a bit, you'll see how close it was to the windings. I'm guessing that's where it was most likely to have flashed across when uh, it failed its uh, insulation test at 3,000. Well, it didn't fail it. 3,500 was pretty good going. That's AC, by the way. So the peak voltage would be um, one point... Four times that. Okay. Right. And then under that is the primary. It's wrapped in blue tape. The flame, they're using just every colour here. Is Does the black have some symbolic... Is it some higher dielectric strength? Is it thicker? Not sure. Although you'd think that, technically speaking, the feedback winding is also referenced to the main, so um, both these would have to be a sort of equivalent insulation. Uh, it's not got the double insulation that a typical compliant product would have. A good example being the recent uh, Poundland power supplies that were just splendid inside. Let's see if I can grab that bit of tape and undo it. That is so, it's been put so tightly on that it's actually gone a bit transparent in bits. And that is just the primary. That's it. So that really was the quite uh, large number of turns of the primary, then the secondary uh, to the output, and then the feedback winding over the top. So it roughly emulated the output to the secondary. It wasn't bad, but it still doesn't have that level of isolation that uh, is required in... Uh, our products to prevent those nasty incidents where people get electrocuted just by holding their phones or stuff like that. Or in this case, uh, grabbing hold of the battery to pull it out of the unit and suddenly finding it was live. But that, uh, having said that, uh, it, this did pass its test. And I suppose you're, it, winding the transformers like this does... I'm not going to unwind this whole thing. This is just tons of winding turns. But uh, Winding this transformer with standard wire just introduces that slight risk that, you know, there is going to be a chance that you're going to have arcing over from, you know, depending on the quality of the person manufacturing it really what it comes to, and how much care or how much experience or training they have. It would be the difference between uh, the windings getting too close together and actually touching and the risk of the sort of arcing between them or damaged insulation if they weren't really taking much care putting it on. This is where the triple insulated wire, where it's a thicker uh, insulation round the sort of secondary, does provide that extra spacing. But yes, that was a that was an interesting thing. I have to say the amount of value I got out of this uh, greatly exceeded its price in terms of the fun of reverse engineering it and looking at the weird circuitry. Um, now I wonder if I can actually make my own charger in the same case, but probably not mains powered. Maybe USB powered. 
But uh, yeah, interesting enough to take to part. Quite enjoyed that. <laughs>